And this brings us to our sponsor coordinated session portion of the program. Um, again, I would just like to really thank our sponsors, Optimum Infusion Pharmacy and Takeda for the fabulous meeting so far. Um, and we have um, two sponsor coordinated sessions now. Our first session is brought to you by Takeda. Um, learn about GATEX with Dr. Ann Nicklick, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine, Albany Medical Center and Colleen Becker from Takeda. This program is intended for patients and caregivers of patients one year of age and older with short bowel syndrome who are dependent on parental support. So I'd like to welcome um, Ann Nicklick and I would like to welcome Colleen. Let's see if we can't get- Thank you, Andrea. Do you mind giving me the access to share my screen? I absolutely. There you go. Andrea, can you hear me? Yep, I certainly can. Oh, uh, uh, Anna, are you under Rhea? Yeah, for some reason. Oh, oh, wow. Okay, no problem. Let me make you a co-host as well, and we'll get you up on the screen. I don't know awesome. why that. Well, we, while you do that, uh, thank you, everyone. I, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Colleen Becker, and I have the privilege of working on all of our SBS and GATEX marketing efforts at Decada, and really wanted to thank Oli uh, for this opportunity to speak today, and really honored to introduce Dr. Micklick, who, the, who, who Andrea mentioned is the Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Al Albany Medical Center in Albany, New York, and happens to be a neighbor of Oli, so really close by. And Dr. Micklick is going to talk today about short bowel syndrome, and GATEX as a potential treatment option. So I think with that, if we're all set, Dr. Micklick, I can hand it over to you. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad to be here to see and hopefully see you, but um, at least you can see me. Um, I can see Joan. <laughs> um, so today um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, GATEX for those patients who are uh, who have short bowel syndrome and are on either IV fluid or on um, IV nutrition. And um, I think somebody else is going to manage these slides, or am I going to do it? Yep, I, I, I've, got, I've got that for you. So just let me know okay. when you want me to click to the next slide. So the, the program is sponsored by Takeda, and I'm presenting on behalf of Takeda as a consultant and receiving compensation for my time today. And the information that I'm going to be presenting today is consistent with FDA guidelines. So next slide. I'm going to skip this one because it shows up again later. But for some reason, there's two slides. So the, today's program, we're going to start with a brief overview of short bowel syndrome. Many of you live with it, so I don't really have to tell you what it is. Uh, but I'm going to review it quickly. And then I'll talk to you about what GATEX is. Uh, go over the clinical studies that led to approval for the use of GATEX. And then, um, I don't know if it's going to be Colleen, but somebody will go over the OnePath support system that um, Takeda has in terms of helping uh, their um, consumers that are uh, using GATEX. And then we'll take questions, of course. So next slide. So um, we'll start with just an overview of short bowel syndrome. So as you know, short bowel syndrome is a serious and chronic disorder with um, significant malabsorption that generally occurs when parts of the intestines are removed surgically um, and the remaining intestine just isn't enough to absorb enough nutrients from what you're eating and drinking. And this results in what we call malabsorption. And it puts people at risk for malnutrition because you're not absorbing nutrients dehydration because you're losing extra fluid, electrolyte imbalances because in those fluids that you lose, you can lose magnesium and potassium, as well as other electrolytes. And of course, you have um, significant diarrhea and increased stool outputs um, that can contribute to dehydration. Um, and so there are multiple factors that a doctor can use to determine uh, the short bowel syndrome diagnosis so it's not just how much bowel you have, but also the clinical um, condition that you manifest as well that gives you that diagnosis. So after surgery, when you have um, a piece of the bowel taken out, 
Um, the remaining intestine does start to adapt to the fact that that part is missing. And so the lining of the remaining intestine does try to increase its work to increase absorption of nutrients and fluids and electrolytes. And we call that process adaptation. And that's a natural process that the bowel will undergo. Unfortunately, depending on how much bowel you've lost, the intestine that you have left may not be able to adapt sufficiently to make up for what you've lost. And so that leaves you um, at risk of not getting enough nutrients and fluids from what you're eating and drinking. Um, so that you're now needing to obtain appropriate nu nutrient needs through IV support. So either IV fluid or through IV nutrition. Next slide. So many people with short bowel syndrome do require parenteral support. And again, that's either can be fluid support and electrolytes or it can be um, HPN. Um, parenteral support can contain protein, carbohydrate, and fats if you need nutrients. Uh, it can contain vitamins and minerals, and also will contain electrolytes. Um, the amount of parental support you need can range from intermittent use or temporary use of IV fluids to the need for total parental nutrition, in which case you're getting all of your nutrition from your um, HPN. Um, so the parental support provides nutrients, um, but it doesn't necessarily lead to any improvement in the absorption that your bowel is doing. So every person with short bowel is different. Some people need one liter a day, three days a week. Some people need two liters a day, five days a week, or you might need five liters a day, seven days a week, depending on what your bowel anatomy is. So treatment, our treatment goals when we manage folks with short bowel syndrome is to maintain their nutrition and hydration, um, to try and do what we can to help the intestine adapt to improve the absorption of nutrients and fluids, um, and to try and eliminate how much parenteral support you need and to improve your daily life by supporting your healthy work, healthy sleep, and allowing some socialization. So the more we can taper off the parenteral support, the more time you have to live your life and do the things that you like to do. Next slide, please. So GLP-2 is um, a hormone that's produced in the intestine. GLP-2 is short for glucagon-like peptide 2. Um, and the function of this hormone is to help the body to increase its absorption. So it helps the gut to improve its absorption. So a hormone is a chemical messenger. This hormone is produced in one portion of the bowel and it works throughout the bowel to try and improve um, absorption. So if you have more GLP-2 around, um, you can absorb more of the things you eat and drink. Um, you can um, um, in increase your fluid absorption. And GLP-2 plays a role in this process by increasing the height of what we call villi. So if you look at this picture over on the right-hand side, you'll see that um, those little pink finger-like projections there at the top in the second, in the second column there, those are little fingers that are in the intestine. So they're microscopic. So if you think of your intestinal lining as like a little Berber carpet that has all these little projections, those projections are lined by cells that do the absorption. So the bigger those villi are, the longer they are, the more absorption your bowel is able to do. The other thing that GLP does is it increases blood flow in the intestine. So the more blood flow that's going through the intestine, the more efficiently you're going to absorb nutrients. Um, so increasing the surface area and increasing the blood flow of the intestine helps the body to absorb nutrients. Next slide. So treat, oops, that went backwards. Go one more. Okay, so no, that's right. So um, if you have short bowel syndrome, you may have less GLP-2 production because GLP-2 is actually made in the intestine. So if you've had 
a, re a portion of your bowel resected, you've lost some of those cells that can produce GLP-2. Um, and if those body parts are removed, you can't make enough GLP-2 to optimize the absorption of the remaining bowel. Next slide. So this is where GATEX comes in. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what is GATEX and what does it do? So the next slide. So GATEX is for subcutaneous injection. It's a prescription medicine that's used in adults and children that are at least one year or older um, who have short bowel syndrome and who are dependent on parenteral support. So either IV fluid or uh, parental nutrition. Um, we're not, it's not known if GATEX is safe and effective in children who are under one year. Um, the important safety information that um, is, is most important for you to know um, is that um, GATEX can cause some serious side effects, and those would include making abnormal cells grow faster. So if you have normal, abnormal cells and you have a growth stimulant, you may see abnormal growth. Um, you can see increased growth in polyps in the colon which is another name for the large intestine. Um, you can develop a blockage of the bowel or the intestine. You can have swelling, um, which um, can cause um, issues with your pancreas or gallbladder or blo blockage of the bile duct. And you can also develop um, fluid overload because you're starting now to absorb more fluid from your um, GI tract. Next slide. So we'll talk a little bit more about um, these uh, a growth, the GLP-2 being a growth factor. So um, GATEX can make abnormal cells that are already in your body to grow faster. So there's an increased risk that abnormal cells could become cancer. So certainly if you develop cancer of the bowel or the liver or the gallbladder or the pancreas while you're using GATEX, the GATEX should be stopped. If you get other types of cancers, um, you and your healthcare provider need to discuss the potential risks versus the benefits of staying on GATEX and continuing to use GATEX. Now polyps in, um, are gross in the inside of the colon and your healthcare provider will have your colon checked with a colonoscopy for polyps within six months before starting GATEX. And if there are any polyps at that point, they're removed. Um, children and adolescents initially will be checked for blood in the stool um, and will not initially require a colonoscopy unless there is blood detected in the stool, um, and then they can start GATEX. Um, to keep on using GATEX, you, your healthcare provider should have your colon rechecked um, for new polyps at the end of the first year of using GATEX. And if you have no polyps, then your healthcare provider should check you for polyps as needed. And that will depend a lot on what your underlying diagnosis is and your risk for polyps, but at least every five years. So you should never go longer than a five-year interval without a colonoscopy if you're on GATEX. So if cancer is found in a polyp, then the healthcare provider should stop the GATEX. Next slide. So also while on GATEX, there were some reports of blockage of the bowel occurring. So a bowel blockage prevents food and fluid and gas from moving through the bowel in the normal way. So if you have any of these symptoms, you should tell your healthcare provider right away, such as trouble having a bowel movement or not passing gas, um, increasing stomach area or abdominal pain or swelling, increasing nausea, vomiting, or swelling and blocking of your uh, stoma opening if you have an ostomy. If a blockage is found, your healthcare provider may temporarily stop GATEX, but you may be able to resume it depending on your decision together with your provider. Next slide. So swelling, your healthcare provider will do tests to check for your gallbladder and pancreas um, every six months, and you'll be checked for, um, within six months before starting GATEX to monitor your gallbladder and pancreas function um, with 
um, uh, enzyme tests. Um, and you should tell your healthcare provider, again, right away, if you get um, any pain or tenderness in your stomach area or abdomen, any chills or fever, or you notice a change in your stools, if you have nausea or vomiting, or your urine turns dark, or your skin turns yellow, or you notice yellowing in the whites of your eyes. Um, all those can be signs that there may be an issue with your gallbladder, your bile ducts, or your pancreas that your, um, your provider will want to investigate. Uh, next slide. So Gatex works like natural GLP-2. And what you're seeing here is a cartoon of the, um, the protein that is GLP-2. And highlighted there in the orange is one of the building blocks of protein that's been substituted in Gatex for a different building block that's in the natural GLP-2. And that single change in that protein molecule um, allows the uh, Gatex to stay in your system longer than the natural GLP-2, and so it will work clinically. And Gatex is the first and only medicine that works like GLP-2 in the body and um, it, that the body normally makes on its own, although it does have a little bit of modification to um, make it stay in your system for a little bit longer. Next slide. So Gatex has been shown to help the remaining bowel absorb more fluid. So studies show that Gatex increases the surface area in the bowel that you have left and increases the amount of fluid that's absorbed by the intestine in adults with short bowel syndrome. The, the ability of Gatex to improve fluid absorption was studied in 17 adults who had short bowel syndrome. They received Gatex for 21 days and there were three different doses um, based on your weight. So it was 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, 0. Point, sorry, 0 0.03 milligrams per kilogram, 0 0.1 or 0 0.15 milligrams per kilogram in each injection. Um, and the injections were given under the skin, usually in the abdominal wall. Um, all patients in the study knew that they were getting Gatex. Um, and there wasn't any comparison. All of the doses were studied um, except for the smallest dose, um, once daily dose. And, and the bigger doses resulted in enhanced absorption of fluid by the intestine, um, improving absorption by 750 to 1,000 milliliters per day. And the um, biopsies actually showed that there was an increase in the villus height and increase in the crypt depth so that those long finger projections got longer and the depths between them got deeper. So all of those changes resulted in increased surface area for absorption, which led to a decrease in how much fluid volume was being lost through the bowel. Next slide. So now I'm going to talk over the, about the clinical studies that led to approval of Gatex and show that Gatex actually does help us to get off uh, parenteral support. Next slide. So there were two seminal studies that were done. And on the left-hand side of the screen is what we call the STEPS study, which was the first part of these studies. It was a six-month trial, um, and the goal was to um, see if the amount of parenteral support that was required by patients with short bowel syndrome could be decreased with Gatex compared to a group of patients who received a placebo, which means an inactive injection that was not uh, medically um, active. So the goal was to try to see if we could reduce the amount of parenteral support needed by patients by at least 20% by the end of that six months. So at weeks 20 and week 24. Then those patients moved into the steps two extension study and that study went on for an additional 24 months. It included participants from the steps study um, who opted to continue and also um, some additional patients that were 
prepared for the step study, but were never enrolled because the study enrollment was closed. And all of the patients in the steps two got GATEX and they all knew they were getting GATEX. There wasn't any comparison. Next slide. So to talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the six month comparison trial that was done first, the STEPS trial. So there were 86 total patients. They were divided into two groups. 43 patients got GATEX once a day and 43 patients got a placebo. Um, and the goal of the study was to compare these groups to see if more patients treated with GATEX were able to decrease the volume of their weekly infusions at weeks 20 and 24 when compared to the patients who got placebo. And the study also evaluated safety. Next slide. And then the steps two trial, which continued for 24 more months, included 37 of the patients who originally received GATEX, 39 patients who originally received placebo, and then 12 new patients who were prepared for that original STEPS trial, but weren't participants. And all of these patients received GATEX once a day, and they knew that they were getting the medication. Next slide. So in these clinical studies, GATEX was proven to help patients with short bowel syndrome uh, who were on parenteral support. So GATEX reduced the weekly volume of their parenteral support. GATEX um, helped the patients that were on that medication to achieve more time off from their um, infusions. And over time, some patients were able to completely wean from their IV support. Next slide. So how many patients, how successful was it? Okay, so on the left-hand side, you'll see six months. We're looking at the number, um, the percentage of patients who were able to decrease their infusion volume by 20% or more. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that 63% of patients within six months were able to achieve a 20% reduction in their infusion volume. And if you compare that below in the gray, you'll see that 30% of patients who were receiving placebo were also able to decrease their um, infusion volume, but there was a significant difference between those groups. And then on the right-hand side, if you look at the number of people who completed 30 months of GATEX, so six months in the STEPS trial and another 24 months in the STEPS 2 trial, of those 30 patients, 28 of those, 93% um, of patients were able to decrease the volume of their infusion. Next. So if there's another way to look at it, and that is how many days were they free from their infusion? So um, at six months, 54% of the patients on GATEX were off their infusion at least one day a week compared to 23% of patients who were getting the placebo. And by 30 months, 60% of patients were off at least three days a week. So significantly freeing people up to do more things, be out more, and not be as tied down to their infusions. Next slide. And if you look at the 30 patients who completed 30 months of treatment with GATEX, 10 of those, so one third of patients were completely free of their parental support, no longer needed their IV infusions after 30 months. Next slide. So it's important to remember that this takes time. Um, the time to reduction in weekly volume by at least 20% can take up to a year. So for some patients, their doctor was able to reduce their parenteral support after one month, but for other patients, it took 12 months before they were able to have a significant reduction in their infusion volume or even longer. And um, there are some patients who don't respond at all to GATEX and their infusion volumes can't be reduced. We don't see any improvement. Next slide. So if you're talking about a more significant decrease in your dependency on IV fluid, then and you're looking to complete freedom from parenteral support, 
those patients, that one third of patients who was able to completely wean off parental support, some of them were able to wean at seven months, but some of them were not completely free of their IV uh, infusions until 30 months. So it takes patience and takes persistence and letting the time, giving time for the drug, letting it work and see if you can develop more absorption over time. Next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about common side effects, um, what you can expect. Um, the most common side effects that occurred in most, uh, more than 10% of um, individuals who were using Gatex is abdominal pain, nausea, upper respiratory infections, abdominal distension, injection site reactions, vomiting, fluid overload, and hypersensitivity. So you need to you know, be in touch with your healthcare provider, your prescriber of the Gatex, to, if you're having any side effects that are becoming bothersome to you um, and don't go away. So next slide. So again, um, another important uh, uh, safety fact that I need to review is that um, as you are um, using Gatex, your fluid absorption is improving from your gut. So you are at risk of fluid overload um, and your healthcare provider will be checking you for the amount of fluid that's in your body. So too much fluid can lead to heart failure, especially if you already have heart problems. So you need to tell your healthcare provider if you're starting to notice any swelling, especially you'll see it in your lower legs or your ankles, or if you're gaining a lot of weight quickly, which might be water weight, um, or if you get short of breath because you can get fluid into your lungs. Um, and all of these things can happen if the IV volume isn't reduced quickly enough as you're absorbing more of what you're eating and drinking. So, and again, I'm just gonna review the most common side effects of Gatex included um, uh, abdominal pain or swelling, nausea, cold or flu symptoms, skin reactions where the injections were given, vomiting, uh, swelling in the hands and the feet and allergic reaction. Um, and the side effects, it's important to note, in children and adolescents are similar to those that were seen in adults. Um, so just, again, make, su make sure if you're starting on Gatex that you tell your healthcare provider if you have any side effects so that they can be addressed. Next slide. Um, so here are some of the things that it's important to discuss with your healthcare provider before you start Gatex. So it's important that they know if you've ever had a cancer or you currently have an active cancer, um, if you've had polyps anywhere in your bowel, um, if you have a history of heart problems or high blood pressure, or if you've had a history of problems with your gallbladder or pancreas or your kidneys. Um, if you're pregnant or planning to become pregnant, um, we don't know if Gatex will harm the unborn baby. So it's important to tell your provider right away if you become pregnant while you're using Gatex. Um, and um, if you're breastfeeding or planning to breastfeed, it's not known if Gatex uh, passes into the breast milk. So you should not breastfeed uh, during treatment with Gatex and you know, discuss with your healthcare provider about the best way to feed your baby while you're using Gatex. Next slide. Um, in addition, your healthcare provider should know about all the medications you take including the prescriptions and over-the-counter things that you're taking, including vitamins and herbal supplements. Um, using Gatex with other medications can also improve the absorption of these other medications. And so your healthcare provider may need to adjust the dose of your medications that you take by mouth because you may be absorbing more of them um, while you're using Gatex. Um, so tell your healthcare provider who gives you Gatex um, anytime that you're gonna be starting a new medication as well. Um, and call your doctor for medical advice about side effects. Um, and you're encouraged if on Gatex to report any negative side effects of any prescription drug um, to the FDA. And there's a website, fda.gov slash medwatch, or there's an 800 number um, for the FDA, 1-800-FDA-1088, um, where you can call directly and report, I'm taking this medicine, I'm having side effects. 
Well, I, I think it's best you immediately report it to your healthcare provider. Next slide. So um, that, right. that's been my part of the program, and I'm going to turn it over to um, Takeda to talk about their resources for you. Thank you, Dr. Mecklick. Um, my line just needed, so if you don't mind, um, I'm, I'm on my phone, so if you um, can keep that open, that'd be great. I will go through these slides really quickly because I know we're short on time, but I'm going to talk about our One Path product support services and additional resources to learn more. What is One Path? It's a personalized product support service uh, offered through Takeda for um, eligible patients who begin therapy um, with GATEX. Um, so once someone initiates therapy and they go through the process, it will determine if they're eligible to participate in our support services program. For those that are on GATEX, um, once that goes through, they are assigned a dedicated patient support manager, as well as a dedicated onboarding and access specialist or OAS, and they'll work one-on-one -on -one with them to help them get access to their treatment. Our OAS team, our, one our onboarding and access specialists, also provide um, education throughout the treatment journey, both on SBS and GATEX. OnePath is responsible for assisting patients and caregivers throughout the entire treatment process. So they help navigate any insurance coverage issues that a patient or caregiver may experience. Also, they go over any financial assistance options that may be available to them. They help coordinate medication delivery and if requested, we, they also help with nurse training to make sure that they're comfortable administer, administering the medication. And lastly, they are responsible for providing ongoing support um, to any treatment access needs that may arise throughout their treatment journey. The One Path patient support managers are available Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time. And you can visit onepath.com to learn more. In terms of additional resources for GATEX, you can visit our website, gatex.com, where you'll find a lot of the information Dr. Mikulik um, talked about today with expanded information, as well as some downloadable resources that you can use and also be able to fill out and share with your healthcare provider. We have a Facebook page, so you can find us on Facebook and like us to follow the page at facebook.com backslash gatex, where we put up put out a lot of different information around SBS and GATEX and where you can actually connect with others in the community. And then finally, uh, of course, our advocacy partners, uh, OLE uh, has a ton of resources on their website and National Organization for Rare Diseases, NORD at rarediseases.org. And with that, uh, I don't think we have time for Q&A, but thank you so much for attending. <laughs>